Ottawa. Well, I think I can speak for everybody when I say we probably imagined that we'd be through the pandemic by now. However, COVID-19 had different ideas for us. And throughout these difficult times, the city has had to continue making important decisions on our behalf. This show gives you an opportunity to connect with your elected officials and, of course, for them to connect with you. And therefore, I welcome you. Two, Ward Updates 2022. This is a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with Ottawa City Councillors and, of course, the Mayor. We're going to be discussing a number of important issues uh, during these discussions, issues that affect you, your family, and, of course, your neighbours. My guest today is Matthew Fleury, City Councillor for Rideau Vanier. Welcome, Matthew. And I just want to start off by asking you, you know, on a personal thing, this is the way I like to start off all of my interviews and just asking, it's been so difficult on all of us, but on a personal side of things, uh, how has it been for you and your family? Derek, thank you for uh, hosting me today and for providing this opportunity. I'm, I'm quite excited. For everyone to know, I represent all of Lower Town, Sandy Hill, and Vanier, which I think are the best part, uh, parts of our city. And thank you for asking. I'm doing well. I have a four-year-old who started school in September. I'm very fortunate to have a, uh, my mom is a retired teacher, uh, and my wife is able to work from home. So we've been able to, uh, to manage uh, through the pandemic. As a local counselor, it's been extremely busy. It's everything mm -hmm. we do, plus all of the COVID uh, testing, vaccination and all of the, um, the the various ways we've had in terms of uh, providing adequate and clear information to residents. So I've learned along the way and here we are two years into it where it feels like uh, a bit of a, a normal and, and hopefully one day we can we can get out and, and get to see each other. Maybe Derek, we could do this interview in person soon. Yeah, yeah, I would love that. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind about that. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how about uh, the way that, that the pandemic has affected the way that you communicate with your constituents? Uh, what effect has it had on that, Matthew? Well, we have to be extremely cautious. Uh, we act in terms of how we provide the information and, and from what source. So I've relied heavily on local health information from Ottawa Public Health and from the City of Ottawa. Um, I try not to bring um, kind of my view into it. I want to make sure that I convey official messaging through uh, social media. We've also created a tab on our website, uh, just a COVID tab, where if someone goes and visit messufleury.ca, I have a COVID tab where every time I get official content from the province, from the city, from Ottawa Public Health, from the Recreation Department, whatever it is, we put it on uh, that portal, which which allows residents, if they missed information or if they don't follow me on social media, uh, to continue to uh, have access. And, you know, Derek, before the pandemic, we did newsletters, but we mainly wrote in local newspapers. And right. what uh, this has forced me is to do a lot more um more traditional newsletter format where we, we send a paper copy to most doors uh, in our community. So some of the things we're obviously uh, trying to always keep uh, factual, but also it's important that we, uh, we talk about um, you know, hope and uh, opportunities. And as you know, it's been tough for families uh, recently. And as you know, it's been tough for businesses. So uh, action elements that can continue to support our community. We have so many good examples of that. I, I want to actually. I'm glad you touched on that because I'd, I'd like to hear from you. Perhaps you know one of the the positive stories that's come out of this difficult situation. Uh, I, I would you know when you look at this community as a whole in Ottawa, we always come together. What about in your particular ward? What what is a good you know positive story you can share for us? Let me give you three examples, all very different for de different demographics, but you'll get a sense of the this type of Ottawa we're at. We're, we're like, I'm, I'm chair of Ottawa Community Housing, and in our community, uh, we have many Ottawa Community Housing buildings, seniors' buildings particularly. And uh, throughout the pandemic, for our senior population, think, go back, go back a year ago when we were talking first dose, and we were talking first dose for those over 80, then after it kept going down in age brackets. A lot of the seniors that are low income, they might be quite aged, uh, aging in place, 
uh, have challenges to get out of their unit. They uh, they get yeah. services brought to them, and it, it became really challenging. And we have to give kudos to local doctors, public health, and health and resource center who went and provided what's called an airplane model. They went into the buildings and each in each unit to provide vaccinations for for low income seniors in our community. So that to me is an example of stepping out of traditional approaches and really going to where the need is and uh, uh, providing effective res responses. Another example is um, when uh, the, the, the food banks and um, early in the pandemics, the food banks then ha really had a struggle because they had to close their location and how you access food was very difficult. Well, we had a number of businesses, I'll, I'll name one, um, which is uh, the Grand, uh, the Grand in the Byron right. Market. Uh, they, obviously, they couldn't take uh, uh, they, a restaurant is usually open and you go and sit in the restaurant and enjoy. But what they went is they pivoted to online uh, sales, which allowed them, they had less online sales, more time in the kitchen. So they were making warm meals for uh, families that were in motels uh, and families in shelters. Uh, they've continued that. They began that in the pandemic, and they've continued continued that uh, throughout. Um, so, so those are sort of two of the ideas that come to mind. But certainly, there's so many more uh, when you think of uh, the Rita Winter Trail and the Gear Library that's come out of it, uh, where folks in the community who don't necessarily have cross country skis or um, or winter equipment to get out can access it as, as a library. Like think about your library card, you get a book. Yeah. Well, in this case, you get free sports equipment to get and enjoy the outdoors. So I'm giving you like three extremely small uh, things that come to mind, but there's so many. I've, I've, I've really seen the struggles in the community, but also I've seen so much hope. Uh, the community advisory group, I wanted to get to some specific things to the ward as well. The community advisory group uh, mandated by Ottawa City Council uh, to review the, the Salvation Army's proposed development. Uh, that, that first meeting happened, I believe, January the 13th. Um, can you give us an update of, of what was discussed at that meeting? This is something that, you know, uh, a lot of constituents have been talking about for quite some time, Matthew. Absolutely. So I, I, I want to take a deeper step into it. Uh, as you know, uh, Ottawa has a, a real, real challenges when it comes to homelessness and the length of time individuals and families stay in motels and shelters. Our goals really needs to be focused on housing where everyone gets a key to a unit um, to, to really stabilize it and be their best. In the case of the Salvation Army, as you know, uh, we need to decentralize the services and they are replicating the model. They're proposing it at 333 Montreal Road. There was a, um, a zoning uh, approval that was granted by council, despite my opposition, that went to the landlord tribunal, a, the, the courts that review a city, uh, city decisions. They were granted last year uh, the, the zoning rights to allow a shelter on a main street. Uh, and then, they, as you've described it, they've submitted for what is the next zoning step, which is a, a site plan review. And council mandated that an advisory group be created. So we had our first meeting. Uh, they presented their updated plans, which are not much different from what we've seen uh, over the years. It's 200, it's almost 300 uh, shelter beds in one location, which again, is an outdated model. If, if we have attention to spend, if we have attention and money to spend, we need to spend it on permanent uh, permanent option. So the um, the MPP, MP, and myself, uh, Lucid Caral, Mona Fortsi, and I continue to be opposed and will continue to do whatever we can to see investments in housing and continue to block this project. Uh, you mentioned Montreal Road. So let's talk about Montreal Road's revitalization, uh, where that stands now and, you know, what what the future, what, what do you hope the future, what's your vision or, and, and your constituents' vision for Montreal Road? Well, Derek, I would hate to just spot, speak of Montreal Road. When we think of an infrastructure and a corridor, we have to give uh, highlights to what's happened in the last year. And, and that, that's the completion of Rideau Street. Rideau Street, through the pandemic, was finally completed. We yes. have Ottawa's Main Street with some of the wi widest sidewalks. Uh, bike lanes, trees. Uh, it's really a transformation. And as you continue uh, east, 
we uh, we have one of the largest infrastructure road infrastructure project in our city happens to be in our community and that's Montreal Road. It starts at, it starts at the Cummings Bridge, which is the Rideau Bridge, and goes all the way to Saint Laurent. So it's 2.1 kilometer stretch, 72 million dollar investment. It's 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 on its third year in the spring and will be done uh, by the fall of 2022. It's uh, it's it's modernizing the main street. It's it's uh, the underground infrastructure needed replacement. And through that, we've been able to improve the surface condition. So putting all of the hydro poles underground, bringing a new um, modern look and feel to the street, the sidewalks, public art, the street furniture, when you think of bus stops, when you think of uh, the lighting, when you think of um, so many of what you, 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 you see along Elgin, what you see along uh, Bank Street and so on is coming to Montreal Road. Um, I know people, because of the reopening of the roadway uh, in late 2021, think that it's completed. It is not. There's going to be some more right. uh, detours planned uh, in, in the spring of 22. Um, you're, you, let's talk affordable housing. It's something that you've been very passionate about. I think we've done an incredibly poor job. I know that we're putting millions of dollars into it as a city. I'm, I'm not sure it's, it's enough money, quite frankly. And I think it no. comes down to really putting pressure on developers and putting in the regulations in place that force developers to create affordable housing. Um, let's just hear your thoughts on that. And, and you know, we know the city has, has a new master plan. Is it a big part of that master plan, Matthew? The city approved the official plan, which really speaks to the way we're going to see development uh, for the next generation, uh, starting now. And it there needs there's certainly a lens for everyone when you think of a supply, which is from a, a macro perspective, we have a supply issue. We don't have enough housing we don't have enough housing types across the city to really uh, respond to the needs of residents today um, my in, my interest and focus is on making sure that uh, neighborhood characters are protected while that to continue to see development specifically near, near lrt specifically on our main streets and through that derek it's important to understand the mechanisms of how we bring affordability or how cities can intervene to bring affordability uh in in and housing and one of the biggest driver of affordability is if it's rental or not when right. you have a rental housing stock when you think of apartments the, the governments are able to provide uh, subsidies to the tenant, either through rent subs, either through head leases, uh, rent gear to income, different models, even in the private sector, uh, which, uh, which allow absorption uh, of some of those economic pressure when you think of uh, house value or buying property, which uh, it, you know, is really becoming unaffordable. I happen to be the chair of the Board of Ottawa Community Housing. We're the largest landlord in the city. We're the public landlord. Uh, where uh, our shareholders, the city of Ottawa. And although we have 15,000 units, we're planning to build 10,000 new units over the next 10 years. And you're gonna say, well, you know, how does that start? I don't know that maybe the pandemic has sort of uh, changed a bit of our paradigm on that, but right now in Ottawa, Ottawa Community Housing has a thousand new units in design and construction. And I'd be glad to share with you some of those projects, but it's important to know what the numbers are. In Ottawa tonight, we have 14,000 residents who meet the revenue affordability. The, 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 they're at a lower bracket of revenue, which means they need uh, supports to access affordable units. That's 14,000 residents, of which um, 2,500 are in our motels and shelters. And, and we were speaking before of some of the models around that, including housing first, including uh, the need for aggressive investments in, afford in uh, supportive housing. Um, and the, the, that housing that you just spoke about, that's the responsibility of the city, you know, there's been, uh, there, there's been a lot of issues when it comes to maintaining those, those apartments, those rentals. Um, you know, I, I would imagine you believe that we need to do a better job as far as that's concerned as well, Matt. Sure. 100%, 100%. Uh, I've been on the board for the last 11 years. I've seen the organization completely change uh, from its strategy, from its approach. And Derek, we're really focusing on two things. One is the tenant experience and modernizing that. How can we be a, 
we're, we're recognized now as a, a very, uh, very caring uh, landlord who is responsive and who invests. So we've been very fortunate to benefit from particularly federal uh, programs and provincial programs in the past to really focus on retrofitting our large buildings. Large buildings are where uh, it's important. We're going to keep that asset. We've done energy retrofits, windows, uh, the ex exterior cladding, the lobbies, the, um, the elevators, to name a few. And then the other one is really uh, redevelopment. So there is an opportunity, as you know, the city has completely changed. Intensive, intensity of how buildings are built and where they're built has changed as well. So most of the townhouses you see of Ottawa community housing are two stories. When the majority of right. zoning allows for four more uh, heights of these stories. So there's an opportunity to redevelop where we can offer better quality buildings that are consuming less energy and uh, that are meeting the needs of today and providing more units overall. So we're working on the two fronts. We have to do a better job of maintenance and th that comes through retrofits and we have to do uh, a much better job of really having modern buildings that meet uh, the needs for of families and individuals uh, in, in 2022. And I think that meet those those scores that we're all looking for, right? So, you know, affordability is is obviously a huge one. Uh, walkability, transit, uh, cycling. Um, you know, doing some of my own research, Matt. You looking at some of the scores and how Ottawa scores as a whole. You know, this isn't ward by ward, but as a whole, we're about forty five out of a hundred walkability. We're fifty out of a hundred when it comes to transit. Uh, on the cycling side of things, we've made great improvements for sure because we're one of the best in the entire in the entire country at about 64 out of 100. But how do we ensure uh, that the city improves upon those scores? What are some of the things we need to do? Because you mentioned developments. You know, I'm in a development uh, that, that doesn't even have sidewalks, right? And we want to make it uh, a walkable city. We want, you know, it to be a, a social. We want to have green space for people to gather. How do we improve upon Ooh. those scores? Well, you touched on an important point, which is the city has an objective of everything you need for your for your well-being in your community needs to be walkable within 15 minutes. And mm -hmm. there are good examples of that in our community. There's also major challenges when you think of parts of our community and, and broad, broadly across the city. And where do you start with that, right? Well, you start with supporting businesses on main streets and how to encourage diversity of businesses on our main streets. Then you look at transit, you look at uh, winter uh, pedestrian networks and, and pedestrian networks overall. You look at completion of cycling corridors uh, to provide those options and you have to make sure that transit's in place. Beyond that, what's, what's important as well is green space. You, we've learned to uh, really rediscover through the pandemic the importance of green spaces in those parks. And I'd go a touch above. As a large city now, we're confronted with major youth shooting and gang issues. And mm -hmm. for us to really take a step forward and become um, uh, a, a proud capital city, we can't fall into what other jurisdictions are facing in terms of gang challenges. The way to do that, and it fits into the 15 minute neighborhood environment, is really to invest in spaces, recreation spaces, where youth in the evenings, on weekends, during the summer, have spaces to go out. Uh, you know, we have a lot of our, uh, we have a lot of youth that are artists. We have a lot of youth that are athletes, and and we need to create those spaces. I, I see so many barriers right now for youth to be able to access even uh, their school uh, facility outside of school hours, which to me kind of irks a lot of the challenges that you were you were talking about around the the scores and the rating for quality of life for. Uh, objectives of a 15 minute neighborhood and meeting that all we need, uh, all we need within uh, proximity of where we live. Uh, let's talk po about police services because uh, you know they, they're part of the community, a very important part. There, there's there's a mistrust in in many communities when it when it comes to the police as part of building a community. You know it is building um, a, a bridge to that divide that we seem to have between police and the public in certain areas. How can we improve upon that? And, you know, the police services budget, of course, there, there are a lot of discussion around that. Uh, people, you know, describing or, or sorry, discussing defunding the police. Um, how can we bridge that gap between police and public and especially in certain areas in, in our city? 
I think there are two real um, areas of challenges. One, which is how can we ensure that policing today is modern and diverse and meets the needs of a capital city and, and expectations of residents of Ottawa? And, and that is uh, ingrained in how do we ensure that uh, auto, uh, police officers are engaged in our community, work in our community, uh, that have the supports, the mental health response, the mental health supports within their work environment to be uh, to be effective and, and to be engaged. On the other front, uh, we do need to have a modern response to some of the most challenging of situations when you think of homelessness, when you think of addictions, when you think of mental health, when you, so for me, the, the collapse of, of those two have, have created the tension points that uh, that are, are now well covered in, in media and, and being discussed and debated. Uh, I, I don't want to pretend that I have the ultimate solution, but I, I do think mm -hmm. that we as a society need to properly invest and uh, not just, you know, it's not just a program in a community, it's an approach citywide to properly uh, respond uh, with health professionals, with social workers to mental health and addictions. And there are many, many gaps. And as I, I don't know if you knew, but uh, starting uh, this year, the city is doing a pilot project in the Byron Market on Rideau Street, so Lower Town, Sandy Hill, and including the Two Business Improvement Association. It's called a Community Imp uh, engagement team. And the role of the community engagement team is to relieve businesses and residents from some of those uh, non-criminal activity necessarily, but from some of those, right. the social challenges we face. Residents are tired of calling 911 or 311 and, and the response is there's so many gaps in the response. So, you know, we, we put it at the feet of police because obviously uh, when you call 911, someone shows up, it happens to be the police. It's, it might not be the right, right response to that. And they have their own challenges. I don't want you to, to think I, I'm um, I'm ignorant to that. But I think from the, this pilot can really show us how can we respond in a proactive manner to some of those real issues in the community and do so with, a, uh, with the individual and the community in mind. If the individual is suffering from uh, addiction issues, how can we make sure that they find a, unit, a key to a unit, and then that they have the mental health and addiction supports that are needed. It, right now, it just it's assumed that you know where to go and that there's no waiting list and so on, which is the opposite. Even if we're a wealthy city, there are many gaps in, in some of those services. Uh, let's turn our attention to, to transportation for a moment. How do you feel about the transportation options available, specifically to, to constituents in, in your ward? Uh, you know, we're looking at this, we seem to look at it as a, in a broader sense right across the city, but specific to your ward, uh, you know, what are you hearing from your constituents as far as, you know, the, the transportation avail available to them and the affordability of it? Well, so transportation to me is everything. Uh, when you think of you walk out of your home and you walk on a sidewalk, is that sidewalk accessible? Can you walk to where you want to go? Uh, is that safe? And, and I would say to that, that generally in, our, in my community, we have a good network, a good pedestrian network. The issues that I hear relating to pedestrians is really on winter maintenance. Um, yeah. As you know, uh, I, we have the commercial districts, we have the Rideau Center, we have the University of Ottawa. There's a lot of people that go and come to those areas daily. And the reality is the city is so maybe traditional in its approach to winter maintenance that we struggle with some of the higher priority and very busy sidewalks in our area. So that would be one point. Uh, we talked earlier about cycling infrastructure. We've seen a lot of improvements, like for example, in our community, a Dawey Bridge connecting the Eastern part of the Rideau River, Vanier, Overbrook to, uh, to Sandy Hill which then connects through to um, through the center town and city hall area uh, with the Corkstown Bridge. That's been a tremendous improvement and corridor. Uh, but I think the challenges that remain is those designs, uh, cycling tracks, and how, how each of these are tied in in a, in a more comprehensive networks and priority corridors remain a top issue uh, for, 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 uh, for everyone to cycle. Many choose to cycle. I choose to cycle when it doesn't snow or when it's not cold outside. 
Um, and, and, and for me, it's safe, but it's not safe for everyone. And I recognize those, those missing links and gaps. After that, uh, Derek, I'd go to transit. Uh, mm -hmm. When the LRT works, it is much love. It has really become a, a, a very much like service when it is there. Uh, the issues, as you know, is a, a, an issue of confidence and trust in the system. Uh, and that, that is day to day. The proof is in the pudding. We have to dedicate ourselves to reliable service day in, day out to make that a reality. In terms of transit in our area, I'd say it's generally good, but the system itself really needs to, 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 to turn a bit in terms of being a lifestyle. It's really a strong system, which is a commuting system, Monday to Friday, nine to five. And for so many in the community, they, they want to choose to use transit, uh, buses in, in, in the spirit I'm giving, but there, there's not Sunday morning service. There's not, uh, there, there, there's good Monday to Friday. There's not midday, weekday service. So as we've learned that from COVID, people work from home, but then when they go for their groceries or when they commute, the, the bus system just doesn't work. It, it was really designed. Yeah. Uh, for for that Monday to, to Friday commute, so there's a lot of things. Yeah, it there, seems to be a lot of improvements that are needed. Yeah, I was going to say it seems to be a little bit forgotten, and um, you know when you know even outside of the pandemic, you know when we start coming back to normal. Uh, I, I think part of the difficulty is people get new habits, right? And it doesn't matter what that new habit happens to be for a lot of people it's going to be their car they're, they're they get in the habit of you know they they get into their nice warm car they don't have to have the walk and so forth um you know we've got a 2.5 percent fare increase which some people are criticizing saying the timing is poor but it, what should we offer more incentives for people to to get back and I, obviously i know the affordability reliability confidence all of those things come into play but should there be more incentives to get people back using public transportation like the lrt like the like oc transpo the the, the short answer is yes the the complicated answer is people will use transit if it works and then the second piece, and if it's there, and they will also, uh, the second piece is it needs to be affordable. And the affordability conversation is a big one right now. Uh, as you know, we've lost ridership, significant ridership. It's close to 200 million we've lost in revenue fare uh, in this last yeah, year. That's, so a, that's a huge loss. Before I, sorry, Matthew, before I run out of time, I'm just down to about 60 seconds, but I know that you were contemplating perhaps throwing your hat into the ring and, and running for mayor. You have not made that uh, decision as of yet do you do you have a you know a sort of a a time limit on when you're going to make that final decision well derek it's a it's a privilege to represent my community as you know i'm, I'm still in reflection what do you think you think i should run <laughs> you're not allowed to put me on the spot like that that's just not fair of course i think you should run i mean anybody that wants to run i would i would certainly encourage them to run and uh i, I think you would uh, like i like i think Catherine mckenney would make a wonderful mayor and diane deans would make a wonderful mayor and bob shirelli and so on i also think you would as well and you you have the experience and the energy you're very generous derek i i'm still in reflection but thank you for the question Okay, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Matthew, for spending time with us. I uh, really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. And, and, and Derek, uh, invite me anytime. I, I'd be glad to continue these chats. Oh, happy to hear it. All right. Thanks to you at home as well for watching. This has been another in our series of Ward Updates 2022. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. We're creating space for change. Progress. Equity. Reform. This is a call out, a shout out, a reach out. To help small businesses, charities, and organizations that support equity deserving groups. Let's promote progress by promoting your brand. We're all in. Dedicating our production resources and media platforms to shine a light on 